is the C-130, called the Hercules, named after the most popular god of Greek mythology, famous for his incredible strength and courage, renowned for accomplishing a multitude of difficult feats. The aircraft has lived up to the reputation of its namesake in power, versatility, and achieving the difficult. Designed as a tactical transport, able to operate from anywhere on Earth, it early showed strategic capabilities as well. It's the most widely used military transport aircraft flying today. The story of the C-130 starts with the A model, first used by the Air Force in 1956. It proved itself on both short-haul missions, supporting ground troops in the field, and on the long-range jobs, lifting heavy cargoes across the oceans. The shape and dimensions haven't changed through the years. It's just under 100 feet long with a low-slung body. The tip of the vertical stabilizer is nearly 40 feet high, and the wingspan is more than 130 feet. The manufacturer produced over 200 of this successful first version, and many are still in use by the Air Force. On the ground, the A model is easily recognized by its three-bladed propeller. Beginning with the B model, a four-bladed prop was used. Modifications and improvements over the earlier version included more powerful engines, greater fuel capacity and range, and a bigger payload. This aircraft, like its predecessor, had a forward cargo door, which is no longer used. Many of the B model 130s remain in service as part of the Air Force's active cargo fleet, proving their reliability in daily service. This is the Hercules of the 1960s, the E model, E for extended range, as good as the earlier ones were, and still are, this one is even better. The greater distance is largely due to the new 1,400 gallon tank under each wing. With a single refueling stop, the aircraft can carry 13 tons of cargo from the United States to Japan against a 50 knot headwind. Across the Atlantic, it'll haul 16 tons non-stop and it needs only a minimum of runway, especially for an assisted takeoff like this. Its four turboprop engines give the Hercules unique power and dependability. This E model has been called the most versatile and reliable medium transport aircraft in America. The engines operate at constant speed, which provides instant power response and simplifies the control of other aircraft systems. The flight controls are all hydraulically boosted for easy handling. The Hercules can carry passengers, paratroops, or cargo anywhere. Land on a paved runway or in a cleared field. And come to a stop in just 800 feet, aided by its anti-skid system and fully reversible props. Anti-skid means the pilot can brake as hard as he likes without danger of the brakes locking. And fully reversible props means this airplane can do the extraordinary. It can back up. There are many features that make the Hercules easy to work with, no matter what your job. Cargo loading is through the wide opening in the tail section. The ramp can be locked at any convenient position for the job at hand. Level, it's at truck bed height, about three feet off the ground. The compartment at its smallest point is nine feet high by 10 feet wide, and its length is 41 feet. Tie down points are provided throughout on the sides and floor. An additional 5,000 pounds of cargo may be strapped to the ramp before it is closed. Here are some of the loading configurations of the aircraft. For various cargo delivery techniques, these dual rail tracks can be installed. Seats can be arranged like this to accommodate passengers or to carry nearly a hundred combat equipped soldiers. With a wider seat belt spacing, the aircraft becomes a paratroop carrier 
with space for 64 men. Another change, and Hercules is ready for an air evac mission, transporting 74 litter patients and two attendants. In use, the aircraft is adaptable to every kind of circumstance, environment, and climate. Small cargo can be loaded on and off by hand. Vehicles can drive up and down the ramp under their own power. Even transporting a helicopter is no great challenge for the C-130. But the most modern cargo handling technique is the system known as 463L. With it, a full 15 and a half ton load can be handled in minutes. Wherever our armed forces may need to go to fight the country's battles, the Hercules can be there, bringing in the men, their equipment, and their supplies. Using incredibly short distances for landing and takeoff, it can operate on totally unprepared strips. It can deliver its payload in any of a half a dozen different ways. On the ground. Parachute drops from altitude for men. And for equipment. And even for animals. Low level parachute extraction. The pendulum technique. Snatch method, with the aircraft almost touching down but never stopping. For rescue, a special version of the Hercules can pick up a man right off the ground. Skyhook, they call it. The C-130 can operate nearly anywhere on Earth. In the heat of Africa, delivering materials for a remote tracking station of the Gemini Man in Space program. In faraway Thailand, bringing in passengers from a Mercy airlift. Over the Greenland ice cap, transporting men and equipment for the construction of distant early warning radar stations in the far north. With the Navy on skis, the largest aircraft ever to operate at the South Pole, the first aircraft ever to land at isolated bird stations. aboard an aircraft carrier at sea without the benefit of a resting gear or catapult. Other uses of the Hercules are almost without number. The Air Force has put it to work launching and guiding target drones. As an airborne command post, a communications center. For aerial electronic photo mapping and the recovery of nose cones. The Coast Guard uses it for search and rescue missions, sometimes cruising for great distances on just two engines. 
and the Marine Corps has adapted it for in-flight refueling. Today, the air forces of several foreign nations are using the Hercules. So are private companies and airlines. Hercules, a proud aircraft with a proven record. You've seen how versatile and capable an aircraft it is. A whole team of men is needed to fly it and to keep it flying. Not just pilots and navigators, but flight mechanics, loadmasters, and maintenance men. If you become part of that team, you will be helping to write the future record of Hercules. continue our walk around of the C-130. Once again, we're using an E model of the aircraft. We'll start this time on the top. Three of the emergency escape hatches are located on top. This is the aft one. For your own safety, work or inspections up here should be avoided in high winds. Stay within the marked walkways. They're strong enough to support your weight and have a non-slip surface for better footing. This is the center emergency escape hatch. It can also be used for emergency depressurization in flight. Be careful to avoid the easily damaged lights and antennas. The center wing dry bay can be inspected by removing this plate. Here's a filler cap used for separate fueling of the auxiliary tank. In the area forward of the flap are stowed two 20-man life rafts. They can be released from here by knocking in the fabric cover and pulling on the handle underneath. Next, we come to the inboard dry bag and the filler for number three main fuel tank. A grounding jack is located near each filler cap. Most of the fuel is carried in the main tanks, which are integral to the wings. That means the skin of the wing also forms the top and bottom of the tank. Between tanks are the areas called dry bays. With an inspection panel removed, you can see what the outboard dry bay looks like. This is the side of a main fuel tank. And these are lines and controls of various aircraft fuel and hydraulic systems. When inspecting a dry bay, check for signs of leaking and smell for fumes. Here's the filler cap for number four main tank. From this point to near the wingtip, there is a row of fuel tank access panels. The left wing has an identical layout with only one important exception. Along with the two life rafts stowed here, there is also an emergency radio transmitter attached to the inboard raft by a lanyard. That completes our view of the top. We'll now go back down and start through the interior, beginning in the cockpit or flight deck. Later on, you'll be learning details about some of the flight deck systems and equipment. For the time being, we'll simply point out general locations. The forward panel contains the most important flight instruments. the pilot's instruments. Engine instruments in the center. 
On the right, co-pilot's instruments and hydraulic control panel. Now let's take a look at the overhead panel, starting at the windshield and working back. In the first group are the panels for engine start, ice detection, control boost, oil cooling, and fire emergency. Next, the fuel control panel, and the electrical control panel. The final group has controls and gauges for pressurization and air conditioning. Gas turbine compressor, air turbine motor, and anti-icing. On the left side of the overhead panel is a T-handle for emergency depressurization of the aircraft and two valves used in ground check of the pressurization system. These valves should be left in the open position. For taxiing, the pilot steers with this wheel, which turns the nose gear. The area on the wall behind the pilot seat contains several different types of equipment. These are called the pilot's upper, lower, and side circuit breaker panels. This group has oxygen regulator controls, paratroop caution and jump switches, switches for the paratroop alarm bell, and the air deflector door, and a windshield defogging handle. Just forward is an MA-1 portable emergency oxygen bottle. In the same area on the co-pilot side, there are, first of all, more electrical panels. The co-pilot's upper, lower, and side circuit breaker panels. Here, there are miscellaneous propeller controls, such as low-level oil lights, negative torque lights, feather override buttons, and prop governor controls. Another MA-1 oxygen bottle is located here. Between the pilot's and co-pilot's seat is the flight control pedestal with the engine condition levers, throttles, radio controls, autopilot controls, flap controls. The navigator's station is behind the co-pilot on the right wall. Three items are of particular interest. The flare gun to signal for rescue following a crash or ditching. A switch that controls radome anti-icing, which must always be off while on the ground. And a manual override handle for the air conditioning system in case the automatic controls malfunction. Overhead, about in the middle of the aircraft, is a mount for the navigator's sextant. On the aft wall of the flight deck are two bunks for off-duty crew members on long flights. Behind the upper one is the main AC power distribution panel. Nearby are several pieces of emergency equipment. The wing life rafts can be released by pulling these handles. There are also an escape rope fire bottle, and first aid kits. The emergency exit light is one of seven placed around the aircraft. They are designed to come on automatically in case of crash or loss of aircraft electrical power. And they can also be used as portable flashlights. Overhead at the rear of the flight deck is the forward emergency escape hatch. And this handle can be used in an emergency to jettison the crew entrance door.
When you let down the hatch above the crew door, it becomes a flooring for the galley. Galley equipment includes running water, a coffee heater, a place for food stowage, an oven, and a cold box which uses dry ice. Just below the flight deck are a number of electrical and electronic components. For access to them, remove the ladder. Looking in, you can see on the left racks of radio and navigation equipment. And on the right, some electrical control gear. In the far corner, covered by insulation, is the flight deck air conditioning package. Now looking forward toward the nose of the aircraft, these are power inverters. And over here is a window that you can remove or chop out for access to the nose gear in case it should fail to lock down for landing. Reaching out through the window, you would wrap a chain around the nose gear and then attach the chain to a tie-down point. That finishes our tour of the flight deck. Immediately to the rear is the cargo compartment. We'll start at the forward end and work our way around. This bulkhead, separating the cargo compartment from the flight deck, is generally referred to as Station 245. The interphone stowed here is for use by the jump master or other flight crew members. This panel has the jump lights and the cargo compartment lighting controls. The gadget up here is the static line retriever. Before jumping, the paratroops hook up to this line. When they've gone out, the retriever is used to haul their static lines back into the aircraft. This is a great deal easier than the previous method, pulling in the 60 lines by hand. Next, there's a fire bottle, a crash axe, and a urinal. The stanchions are part of the equipment for installing seats or litters and are kept here when not in use. Behind them is a high voltage power distribution panel. Here's one of the two portable emergency oxygen bottles located in the cargo compartment. The jack pads to raise the aircraft for maintenance work are always carried on board. Below, an oxygen shutoff valve. The air conditioning unit for the flight deck can be reached behind this access panel. Returning to the left side, the next item is a control for emergency lowering of the nose landing gear in case the normal system should fail. An A-frame runs down the center, the entire length of the compartment. It provides support for mounting the seat and litter stanchions. Several boxes, like this one, contain tie-down straps for the litters. A speaker for the public address system is mounted here. The seats can be stowed along the sides of the compartment when not set up for use. Here are more first aid kits. Altogether, there are 23 of them on board. This hump is the landing gear wheel well. At the forward end of it is the reservoir for the utility hydraulic system. The sight tube shows fluid all the way to the top indicating that the reservoir is full. In case of a system failure in flight, the gear and flaps can be lowered manually by pulling these handles and using the hand crank. The utility hydraulic system is driven by pumps on engines one and two and operates the flaps, landing gear, normal brakes, nose gear steering, and half the flight control. Down below is the oil tank for the gas turbine compressor. The dipstick is in the cap. 
This cap must not be removed during pressurized flight. When the aircraft is carrying passengers, the compartment is heated. An overhead fan draws in air and recirculates it to help keep the temperature uniform. In the center wing section of the aircraft is the main bleed air line. From here, hot air is tapped off to various systems. Anti-icing, underfloor heat, and so forth. This isolation valve can be tripped from the cockpit to shut off hot air flow to the wing. Resetting the valve must be done by hand. At the front and rear of the wheel well is a landing gear inspection window for checking to determine whether the gear is locked properly. Just aft of the wheel well, overhead, is the motor that drives the flaps. And the horizontal cylinder over here is the aileron hydraulic boost package. Now we come to the center emergency escape hatch. For escape or access to the top through the center hatch, you'll need the stanchion ladder. Climb it from the right side of the aircraft. The hatch opens like this. Hold it in place until it's free, so it won't bounce off your head. Replacing it is almost as easy. For emergency depressurization of the aircraft, this part of the hatch springs open when the pilot pulls the cockpit control handle. The bungee cords keep it from hitting the vertical stabilizer. When the aircraft is jacked up for maintenance, it's important that it be kept level. To provide a check, a plumb bob can be hung from here. And readings taken from the leveling plate. Other equipment located here, just forward of the paratroop door, includes another fire bottle, the aft circuit breaker panel, an electrical outlet for operating an iron lung, and ATO jettison handles for dropping off the bottles after an assisted takeoff. The paratroop door operates like this. Just aft is the jump master's oxygen regulator and the controls and hand pump for the auxiliary hydraulic system used for opening the cargo ramp and door. This system also provides an emergency backup for the brakes and for extension of the nose gear in later C-130 models. The toilet can is stowed here. This is the grasshopper, which extends to hold the cargo ramp at truck bed level. Behind it is the auxiliary hydraulic reservoir, accumulator, motor, and pump. Stowed overhead in this area are paratroop jump steps. They fit in place outside each paratroop door. The cargo door is used for storage of items like the paratroop ladders, tie-down chains and straps, and seat belts. All the way back are the rudder and elevator boost packages and the cabin pressure safety valve. Along the right side of the aircraft, the layout is pretty much the same, with only a few significant differences. This area is used for miscellaneous storage, including a crash axe and fire bottle. Just after the paratroop door are alternate controls for releasing the life rafts. At the aft end of the wheel well is another MA-1 oxygen bottle. And at the forward end is the booster hydraulic system operated by pumps on engines three and four. 
It provides power for one half the flight controls. Manual lowering of the right main landing gear is done here. Nearby is the side emergency escape hatch. This DC power outlet is one of the seven located around the compartment. And just aft of station 245 are the oxygen regulators for the loadmaster and scanner. Well, that's it. That completes our walk around of the C-130 Hercules, the Air Force workhorse of many jobs. If you're assigned to this aircraft, you'll learn your way around it soon enough. You'll learn, too, the satisfaction that comes from being on the Hercules team.